welcome to Talking Art. This is the Deerfield Arts Bank and I'm Jane Trigere and we're continuing our conversation with local artists. Currently at the Deerfield Arts Bank we have an exhibit called Weaving Up and Down, 13 Tapestry Weavers. Look forward to seeing you. And uh, today's guest is Jim Murphy. Many of you locally may know him and now I'm getting to know him also. Jim, welcome. Thank you, Jane. So, um, I like to ask people, um, but I have a feeling I, I'm, getting, I'm getting a variety here of responses to this question. Where are you from? I was born in the eastern part of the state, Norwood, in 1947. We don't need to know your age. You don't? Okay. <laughs> the fact <laughs> that you're a year older than me does not interest anybody. All right. Of course not. <laughs> What, uh, what brought you to this part? Oh, let's see. Probably shortly after I got out of college, I had a number of friends that were doing COs. They were conscientious objectors. Uh, one of those people uh, was living up in Heath. I would occasionally come out and visit. And I eventually uh, decided this is the part of the world I wanted to be in. I'm trying to figure out what being a CO has to do with being in Heath, but I don't think that's important to this uh, show. Probably we not. We could talk about that later. Although I can't get my mind off of it. Okay. <laughs> um, You'll get over it. <laughs> I'll get over it. So, and you just came and you stayed? Well, I would come out and hitchhike out, spend some time up here, go back to Boston. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed more like home here. You know, I was in the city. Uh, I wasn't a natural for the city. I liked it out this way, and eventually I came back. Uh, so what year did you come here? 73, 1973. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> somewhere along the way, you became an artist. Can you tell me the journey? Did it become, start in art? In, did you do art school? Did you do it in high school? Well, Where? probably at home before I went to school. Yes. Um, there were eventually... Um, Ten children in the family, and a lot of kids in the house on a rainy day. My mother would give us crayons and paper, and um, probably that's where it began. And I might have been, I, I'm not sure when a kid starts drawing, but very, very early, you know. And you stood out. <coughs> well, I might have stood out a little bit. The other thing is I never stopped. Uh. And I heard, heard an interesting thing. I may be going off topic a little bit, but there was a fellow I met one time who was explaining to some young children, grade school kids, that he taught in college, and he taught how to paint and draw. And one of the children said, well, how come? Had they forgotten how? And I guess, you know, it's kind of an interesting perspective on things. Mm -hmm. So it w it's been a constant in my life. I n there was never a time when I didn't do it. And, and uh, <clears throat> we have in front of us here so, so did you end up going to art school? I did, Mass College of Art. So that was your college education? That's right. Oh, so that's appropriate and wonderful. Yep, yep. And, and did you continue as an artist? I always... Working uh, as an artist. It's well, always interesting to see how do artists, do they support themselves with their art? Well, I never have, no. Um, I continued to draw and uh, eventually got... Uh, you know, for a period there, I didn't do any work in oil for close to 30 years after I graduated from college and then returned to it uh, somewhere around 20 years ago. Um, so I always did it, but I never supported myself. It's almost impossible. So I've done all kinds of things, painted houses, worked as a cook, an exterminator. I was in human services. Wait a minute, those go together, those two? Well, they... <laughs> Go together if you want to feed yourself. No, no I meant the exterminator and the human services. No, that was, certainly sorry. Not. <laughs> That's okay. I joke at your expense. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> if you want to feed a family, right. Yeah. Right. So, we have some pieces in front of us uh -huh. and behind us. Right. And we'll talk about all of them. <clears throat> the earliest pieces you brought here, one is a drawing of a man running. And one is a watercolor. Watercolor. Of 
I found out it's you. Yeah, so a portrait I see, from I, I see it now. 20 some odd years ago. Yeah, more curly hair, yeah. probably 70s, three. Oh, more when recently people had than that. Probably when had people had long hair. Probably 1990 or something like that. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> what? Tell us about the, the first one. Well, um, I for a long time I did a lot of drawing. I was just working in black and white, and this, in fact, was probably uh, it's tracing paper, and I traced over a drawing I had done before because I wanted to get clear definition black and white, and I probably had intention of reproducing it, but I didn't know how to do the half tones. So um, it was dr drawn, the references were probably several photographs from a running magazine, and I've always done a lot of running. That's the other consistent thing in my life, um, distance running and, and painting. And so for a good number of years, um, during idle hours, I would try to refine and simplify what I had seen in photographs. And that's what this is about. Now, when you say <clears throat> you wanted to reproduce it, but you didn't know how to do half tones, can you explain that? Well, I had ambitions of maybe selling illustrations to magazines. Yes. But they, they really weren't interested in that. If you look at I, I did a couple for a magazine one time, but they're mostly interested in doing photographs. But it kept me involved. But tell me what the halftone part has to do with anything. Well, what the halftone has to do with, with my limited understanding of how to, how to reproduce drawings. Um, you know, I'd go down to the photocopy place and try to copy a drawing I had done, and it wouldn't come across looking like the drawing. And it became clear to me that a black and white line drawing was going to produce better. So that's what you see here. I see. Uh huh. So <clears throat> there's a big jump to 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 this one, to this watercolor, right? Um, I suppose so. Yeah. I um, I was taking a class at the I forget what they call it, Amherst Leisure Services. Leisure Services. Mm -hmm. And Lee, uh, Lynn Peterson was teaching a course yes. there. And so I would go evenings, I don't know for how many months. One of the valuable things was just that you had that regularity. You were expected on a Wednesday night for a couple of hours. And when you had that kind of engagement, you were more apt to do, to work on watercolor two or three times during the week. You know, so it kind of got me back into the, the swing of things. Mm -hmm. And you really have to, I feel, you really have to be doing it all the time. You, you can't uh, forget about where your watercolors are. I want to paint, oh, where are they? I don't know. Right. Maybe next week. So you need to have something set up. So that got me on kind of a regimen. So you have a studio set up? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So I understand that you work in oils now. Right. Why did you, did you not like uh, watercolor? No, I liked watercolor, but I wanted something um, beefier with more body to it. Um, I'm not sure if that explains it, but well, I wanted... Well, I think of acrylics as beefy too. I, I, I'll tell you why I didn't like watercolors. I mean, why I didn't like oils. There was an instructor in school... Oils. No, there was an instructor that was pushing the acrylic paints. This I was see. in the late 1960s. Yes. He worked for a company that developed these. Uh -huh. Very slick guy. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure how to describe it, but kind of seemed kind of inauthentic. Uh -huh. And um, so, he, so he's introducing these plastic paints, and he was a little on the plastic side. So <laughs> my... Natural inclination was I got it. to I reject got it. them both. Yeah. Right, I understand. Yeah. If you yeah. if you hitchhike to Heath to see a friend who's a CO, this fits in perfectly. I think so. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, I got it. <laughs> and okay. the people that we admire. Yes. And this isn't to put down people that work in acrylics. Right. But the people that I grew up admiring all yes. worked in oils. Okay, so who were those? Oh, uh, Winslow Homer. 
I'm uh, assuming he's not a friend. No, no, he's long so, gone. So, so you would go to museums to see yeah, art, yeah. and and Winslow Homer is somebody you Winslow admire. Homer, yeah. Edward Hopper. Yes, Edward um, Hopper. Uh, locally, well, of course, I didn't know him at the at the time, but um, he lived in Conway, William Lester Stevens, um, and those kinds of people. So I kind of always was drawn towards, you know, there's a certain chain of this one taught this one, yes. this one studied that yes. one. And yes. so I kind of see myself in that, in that, in that family group. Yes, I think so, yeah. So where, uh, do you still go to museums? Oh, yeah. Which are the, your museums that you frequent? Well, I was up at the Clark a week or two ago. And how about locally more? Um, do you go down to Springfield? Well, the, the Mead, and then down to the, uh, the Vincent, the, the Springfield Museum. Yeah. Uh huh. Smith. Not so much. I need to get over there again. Uh huh. To the Smith Museum. Yeah. <coughs> so, um, so tell me, <coughs> at some point, <coughs> you picked up oils. What what happened? You said you wanted something beefier. Had you been taught oils at the s at right. school, so yeah. you knew how to do it. Yeah, but it had been a long time. So you retrained yourself. I did, and at the time I was at Mass Art, there was an emphasis on non-representational painting. So well, I was clearly that's not where you fit in. No, not at all. And it was from uh, I was there from '65 to '69. And there was a, a lot going on, and a lot that wasn't, you know, the anti-war movement and all that business, and all kinds of social change going on. And uh, it would have been nice to have a little more involvement in the traditional mm. painting to kind of balance some of that. There wasn't a lot of emphasis on that. Right. So a number of years ago, I would say probably about close to 20 years ago, um, I took a course from a guy that was somehow associated with a Cambridge adult education. And he was there at that time. And his name was uh, Craig Srebnik. And he, he taught a course at, at his home, five or six students, probably three hours a night over the course of maybe two or three months. And I kind of got reintroduced to the basics. Wonderful. Which was just terrific. It made all the difference. So let's go back and look at some of these. The one behind me is the earliest one of these four that you've brought in. Yeah. And um, it's the one that has the, the, the most different palette. Uh -huh. Can you tell me what we're looking at here? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of inspired by uh, a place in Conway. It's called Poland Gate. There is kind of a road cut. There's a, an area where there's a road goes through and there's a very large um, rock ledge on one side and somewhat less on the other. Um, it's kind of a back road, and I've always done a lot of running. So the, the landscape painting and the running are really both journeys through a landscape. And this is kind of like a portal. So it's kind of, you know, I don't know, I probably had gone through there six or eight years before I got down to doing that painting. Well, the, the, the way you treat the paint here is a little different than what I see in the others. You, do you use a palette knife? No. No? I, no. no? So these are brush strokes that are right. very wide and, and flat, and um, it's slightly cubistic. I suppose so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and very impressionistic and extremely evocative. I can feel the run. Uh -huh. I, can, I can see that the sun that I'm running to right. that's hitting those two stumps or whatever those things exactly. are. Exactly. Yeah. So moving along, we may go back, but let's move on. Okay. Now the palette starts to become much bluer, and it stays that way in all the rest of them. Tell well, me about that. Well, the others that you see are all winter scenes, and this one... Do you do something other than winter scenes? <laughs> How come you only brought I, me winter scenes? Because <laughs> it's winter, and I've been to... I see. But um, I've got a lot of paintings out in, in galleries now. What I've got around are these. 
and um, this is kind of a nocturne, kind of a subdued, you know, it could be just a very overcast day, four o'clock in the afternoon in December, or it could be kind of moonlit. And I try to make things that are a little bit, um, I, you might even want to say ambivalent, that, that it's not really clear, I want a little bit of a sense of mystery to it. So, you know, this time of year, you got snow on the ground, um, darkness is falling. That has to be a different palette than, you know, eight o'clock yes. in the morning. In and early why did June. you choose to paint the frame? I had this frame. I, I didn't, this frame wasn't meant to go with this, but painters will tell you it's important to get it into the right frame. Well, it's important to get it into any frame at all. And, um, you know, they can be very expensive. So, you know, it's a, just kind of a matter of making do. You want to get it into a frame that complements the painting. You don't want to detract from the painting. Um, what, what, um, do you draw on the canvas first? No. So you start right off and, and, um, and you start by drawing in the the large features first. Well, in, I, I in, block sorry. them in. I think you'd say more yeah, than line. Them. I'm I'm using masses. So, are we looking at a real scene? You were you, here in the first one. Yeah. You were. Is this a real scene or is this? Well, a, it started out as a real scene, and then you you been, make certain you, judgments. So you did a little it. landscape design here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and that's what you really want to be doing. You, you can fall in love with a certain little passage that you, you put in and it looks lovely, but you stand back. If it detracts from the, from the hole, you need to wipe it out. So this, this pond here, yep. that is a pond, yes? It is, yeah. I feel like there's a, it, there's, part of it is iced over, right. and I can see the part that doesn't have ice, and I could feel that like I could put my finger in there, and it would be wet. Yeah. And it's uh, striking, considering how matte everything else is. Uh -huh. That one really looks wet. And it's amazing how you did that. Well. Uh, so are those two posts in the water? Where, is that a dock? What? It, it could be either. It, it's uh, a little ambiguous and, and intentionally so. So when I'm dealing with a painting, there are certain things that I want to um, make kind of obvious and other things I want to reveal something somewhere and other places I want to conceal it and somewhere in between in between I want a little bit ambiguous and it's not important that you can identify everything any more than when you go out for a drive and you're looking around and, what's that I gotta slow down what is that um, I think that little bit of mystery is good for us and the one uh, uh, about behind you, this one is um, this one is, seems a little desolate. It seems like the well, trees are little, gone or the it's burnt. It's a little spare. Well, it's a it's a it's a the time of day where um, the sun is coming up. It's been cold overnight. You is that a body of water too? Yes. Yeah. 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 So I'm really dealing with a lot of water, either in the form of standing water, ice, snow, or wet laden atmosphere that in this case is kind of a little bit backlit, so you've got a diffused light. Um, it's you're in the to woods. snow. Well, you don't know. It's like it, uh, you, you, you're, you're in between. Yeah, and you make up your own uh -huh. if, if you feel that you want to identify it, you make your own story about it. Down here, the sun has come out. It has. On this last one here. Yeah. The sun has come out. This it's is, cold, but it's sunny. Yeah. Well, this is part of a series. I think I'm calling it A Light Burns in the Dead of Winter. And so I've been spending some time in the woods up on the Bullet Reservation in, um, well, it's Ashfield Conway. It's Ashfield, um, right up near the border there. Um, 
the trustees of the reservation um, own the property, and some local people, a local assembly of people have um, built trails through there. So I spent some time up there running, snowshoeing, walking. And um, so what I'm trying to get at is it, I'm painting my reaction to being in that landscape. It's very quiet. Yeah. You're all alone. Yeah. And it's nature right there in front of you. Yeah. And again, there is that light that takes you to the back. Right. There's something at the end there to, yeah. to aim for. So it sparks your curiosity. Yeah. You know, what's, what am I going to find? But this is a trail. That's not water there. It's a trail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so you work with brushes. Yeah. Are you telling me that your other paintings that are not winter have a different, uh, a different, not a bluish palette like this? Um, I use a lot of blue. You use a lot of blue. You got a friend in the in the blue company. <laughs> yeah, I got a good price. I've got a guy. A guy will stop by the house. I've got a studio now that's in the garage. Yeah. And when it was just the garage and the doors were up and I would paint there, this guy would come by on his bicycle and complain, you're using too much blue. <laughs> he offered to give me a tube of orange paint, and I'm still waiting on it. Still waiting on yeah, it? You so can't find a place out there? <laughs> no, but I'm, you know, you, you kind of, uh, you're drawn to a particular color. And, uh, and do you know why you're drawn to this color? I don't know. I don't bother concerning myself with that. But no. I'm asking. Well, I know you're asking. <laughs> I don't have an answer. <laughs> OK, that's fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Do you ever draw something other than landscapes, like Faces. portraits? Yeah. Um, this may found, sound strange. Uh, if I'm around and there's no other distractions, or if I'm, I've got the TV on but I'm not really engaged, I might take out the Boston Globe, the obituaries, and in, you know a number of them. Increasingly these days, there's a little photograph, a headshot of somebody. And if it's a face that um, interests interested you? in, I do a drawing. What is it that interests you? What makes a face that interests you? Well, there's a, either a kind of a spark of life in that face or some sadness. Some, it, it's got something to do with some emotion, I think. Um, not necessarily drawn to a particularly handsome or, mm -hmm. or pretty face. Mm -hmm. So when some, some, again, maybe, maybe that ambiguous thing that you were talking about, yeah, there's something there. Yeah. Something that piques your curiosity. Right. Uh-huh. And I don't think it's important to, um, to really, def well, it's kind of like opening the door. You know, you're just saying, okay, well, what's this all about here? But I'm not saying, well, this is what this is about. You know, I'm interested in kind of the investigation. The journey, not yeah. the goal, not, yeah. the, not, the, not, not the, the destination. Not the destination. Yeah. And where are you showing your work? Um, at the Day Lily in South Deerfield. That's across the street from us? Across the street. Um, Bear Hollow Antiques in Williamstown. Uh, Williamsburg, excuse me, Williamsburg. Um, uh, trolley stop over in Shelburne Falls, uh, Nash Gallery in East Hampton. Those are the local ones. Mm -hmm. I show at the Rockport Art Association in Rockport, Mass. And a lovely gallery in Dammer, Scott, Maine uh, called River Gallery. And then recently um, in uh, Jamaica, Vermont, uh, the Elaine Beckwith Gallery. Very nice place. And I think you're going to be in my show in a couple of months called Landscape. I've heard that rumor, yes. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Most likely. Most likely. And there, we, we're not going to look for your obituary pictures. We're going to be looking for your landscapes, right? Whatever you want, Jane. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm very curious to see something that is um, w one not, of the other seasons. W not winter. Yeah, yeah I know. I'm, I'm well, we all want to see something that's not winter. Don't we? Yeah. Yeah. 
So, um, so you said that the <coughs> series that you're working on now is called A Light Burns in the Dead of Winter. In the Dead of Winter. So are they all this size, these, this piece? Um, they're tending to be somewhere around that size. That's, um, you know, 12 by 16, I think, somewhere in that range. Um, well, I look this forward is 16 by 20. I, I look forward to seeing the series. Okay, good. I like, it's very interesting to me to see series. Uh -huh. like what's going on in somebody's mind, again, Yeah. it gives me more than one angle on it. Well, is there something I haven't asked you that you'd, you'd like me to ask? Not in front of the camera, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> in that case, <laughs> in that case. I wish you perhaps an orange shirt next time I see you. All right, to go I'll do with that. Yeah, and <laughs> you wouldn't be, you wouldn't object to that, would you? Or, or is your palate? Because I know that your palate is. I'm not going to. You're dressed like your palate. It's amazing. I'm not going to dress in an orange shirt. No, no, okay. me neither. Okay. No, okay. So thank you very much, okay. Jim Murphy, and. Um, to all of you, I thank you very much for joining us. This is Jane Treger. The show is Talking Art, and we're seated in the Deerfield Arts Bank. And if there's something you'd like me to ask that I'm not asking, or if there's somebody you'd like to recommend for me to interview, please email at the email below on the screen, which uh, is uh, talkingart at fcat.tv. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.